everybody, and welcome to our next Leadership Lessons CEO interview. I'm Jason Nazar, the co-founder of Comparably, and I'm just very happy to have today with us Wayne Peacock, the president and CEO of USAA. What's going on, Wayne? Hey, Jason. Uh, really great to be with you guys today. It's a fascinating time in our history and uh, happy to be able to enjoy the and join the team today. Well, thank you so much. It is a rare, unique opportunity for us to talk to a CEO of a company that's been around for 100 years. Yeah. And so it's some special perspective we're going to have for everybody. Again, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, thank you so much. This is a CEO interview series that we do in combination with entrepreneur.com and Comparably. I'm very proud to announce that Comparably is now also part of Zoom Info, uh, the market leader in go-to-market software SaaS solutions. And so this is our opportunity to, to interview amazing folks and talk about their leadership lessons, their if I knew then stories. And so, you know, to me, uh, I, I think this is also really valuable because it's our first opportunity to talk with a category leader in the insurance space too. And with so much going on in the world today, that's certainly top of mind. You've got a relatively complex and massive business here. So in your own words, Wayne, you know, how do you describe USAA today? Well, I think I describe it in pretty simple terms, Jason. Uh, we do one thing and we try to do it really well every day, and that's take care of military families. And we do that by helping them manage their money well every day, um, by protecting their assets and their lives um, and helping them kind of build appropriately to use credit wisely. And um, really at the end of the day, you know, have a plan in place that allows them to you know, create financial security for themselves and live in a way that is um, comfortable for them. Um, and what I would you know, say is um, it, it's a passion for us at USAA um, because we all enjoy living in this incredible country that is the United States. Um, and we know that freedom's not free at the end of the day. Um, and for hundreds of years, um, folks have put a uniform on and they've gone out and put themselves in harm's way. Um, to defend you know, our freedom and our way of life. So and we think about it as just the least that we can do at USAA to be at our best every day to take care of those military families, whether they're currently serving or whether they're veterans and family members that have served in the past. Yeah, you know, it, it's a unique opportunity and responsibility that you all have there. It's not just protecting the lives of so many people, but as you talked about, so intertwined you know, with our military service and, and all those folks that are doing so much for so many people. So I'm sure the weight of that responsibility is, is a big one. You have this amazing journey where you've been with a company now, I believe 30 plus years. And it was just two years ago, you officially took over as CEO. What's that journey been like being at the company for that many years? Well, I would tell you that it's been new and different on an ongoing basis. And then it's been very consistent and the same on others. You know, this idea of um, being in service, um, an opportunity to work on really exciting and challenging business problems, to do it with a great set of teammates, and then to know that at the end of the day, your work matters, um, you know, is what has driven me for the last 30 years. And I would say those are the things that have been consistent, um, but they've taken a lot of different forms um, over the years. I actually, early in my career, you know, was uh, really what was about insure, about uh, real estate investing. And that's, that was what was most important to me. And I joined the USAA um, in our investment real estate subsidiary, where we go out and make investments to build out strength for the insurance company so that we can continue to keep our rates low for members. And even in those early days, we knew that what we were doing out in the world of good real estate deals had a direct impact on serving um, our military members. And I thought that would be kind of my career aspiration for all of those years. Um, but because I was at USAA, um, I had an opportunity and really great sponsorship and mentorship from some you know, leaders who took an interest in me early on um, to give me different opportunities um, and to be able to see other parts of USAA. And I would say one thing has led to another um, where I've been able to work on the investment side and then I've worked on the corporate side and actually I've had a chance to build world-class workplace for our employees to serve members well. I've led our technology teams, our security teams, um, and then really spent a lot of time building out future strategy for the company in the early days of digital. Um, and then really aligning all of our teams uh, to be more member-centric, to be able to serve our members across the full suite of USAA's um, products. Um, and then most recently, before I became CEO, um, I had the opportunity to do 
I think some of the best kind of leadership job at USAA, um, which is to lead our PNC insurance team, where you, know, you get a chance to be part of that big, long-standing, hundred-year-old um, part of the company, um, which in and of itself is an important legacy, um, but also to be able to be out on the front line, seeing how our employees take care of our members on their darkest days when the wind blows or when fires are there or when their house floods and know that USA is there to put an arm around them, to care about them, um, and then to bring the full faith and credit of USAA to bear to get them back on the road again or get their house back together again. That was an amazing you know, opportunity uh, right before I became uh, the CEO. But I'd say I'd look back on all of that. Um, what I try to do today is draw upon that set of experiences um, that were wide and different over the years and try to apply them to a very dynamic marketplace um, that is 2022 and certainly has been the case you know, since we um, took over um, with the pandemic in 2020. Yeah. I, I want to stay on this topic of, of career trajectory for a moment. You know, I, there's this stat that, you know, the average millennial or Gen Z or today in the first 10 years of their career might have something like six or seven different jobs, <laughs> you know, and, and I often think of it as this analogy, you know, in, in the short term, it's like a trader. If you in a hot market, if you jump jobs lots of time, you can certainly make more money. But to me, I think there's also this advantage of staying at one organization for a longer period of time. It's like a stock appreciating. And, you know, I, I'm not sure if you had jumped around to 10 different jobs, you'd have the opportunity, you know, to do what you're doing today. And so the question I have is, if you were counseling somebody in their career, how would, how would they know when to stay at an organization, plant their flag and keep growing versus looking for other opportunities of where they'd want to grow? Well, Jason, I think about this and I'm going to borrow this from Clayton Christian and this idea of having a dominant strategy um, and then being prepared um, to address emergent strategies uh, when, when they emerge. Um, and that starts with being clear about your purpose um, and what you want to do and what impact you want to make uh, in your life. And the more you can reflect on that and have a point of view about it, um, the easier it is to get clear about what I should be doing today. Um, and what I should be doing next. Um, but I think for all of us, um, and my old boss used to talk about this a lot, um, you know, you gotta be prepared when opportunity presents itself. Um, and so you may have a very clear strategy and then the world changes or opportunities arrive and your ability then to evaluate that emerging strategy against what was traditionally your dominant strategy, you know, is a way to kind of frame up, you know, the choices it may not make the answer come to you easily, but it's a great way um, to frame that up. But I, if I put a little bit more specifics in, I would say you know the opportunity to build skills um, that allow you to scale your effectiveness, if in fact you want to lead at scale, may be a good way to think about um, assessing those you know new jobs or new opportunities. Um, and there's both the technical skills that you might gain. And then there's the opportunity to lead and influence. Um, and it's the combination of those two um, that I think bring power um, to be able to kind of really play to your potential you know, as any individual. And so as you think about the skill sets that you had and that you developed, you know, you were working alongside tens or hundreds of thousands of peers. What helps you stand out across these many years to earn that top spot? What did you do different and better than the folks around you? Well, look, I think um, at the end of the day, the ability to get stuff done, to deliver results um, is always a key, um, but doing it in a way that um, matters, um, the, an, a way that brings people along, um, a way that kind of connects and collaborates um, and doing it in a way that is respectful to others, um, I think is kind of the art form that supports you know, the results um, side of it. And I think so many times, you know, folks can collaborate well, um, they can hang out and engage with others well, um, but they don't actually deliver results. And conversely, you see folks that are all about results, um, mm -hmm. but don't really care about connecting and, you know, dealing with their teammates um, appropriately. And it's that blend, I think, that um, leaders today, you know, are, are looking for. And the other aspect I would say is um, kind of, 
what I'll call being a student of the game, um, whatever the game happens to be and be a lifelong learner, kind of a continuous learner and have this natural curiosity of trying to figure out how things work, um, taking them apart, putting them back together again. I think that willingness to ask the question, ask the second question, ask kind of five levels of why mm -hmm. questions um, is another, um, maybe, I don't know if it's in my DNA or a skill that I practiced over the years, um, but that intensity to get to the kind of first principles and get to the core of something and put it back together, you know, differently, I think have, you know, maybe not been distinguishing so much, but certainly have complemented, you know, my, uh, my effectiveness. And so if you have a leader on your team today and, you know, she or he's exceptional at getting results, but you want them to get better on the EQ side, you want them to get better bringing people along. What's that coaching look like? What advice and counsel do you give people? And, and how do you help people move up that skill set of ladders? Well, I think it's really easy as you move up the ladder um, to focus on what you can do um, to drive results um, versus how you create an environment for the team to win. And I have this kind of simple framework. And probably earlier in my career, I was focused a lot on getting it done. Um, and, uh, and my focus was all on the it. Um, now I think about it in terms of my development plan is about the we getting better so that the we can get the it done, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if we really see that our opportunity as leaders is kind of convening you know, the environment of inspiring those who are on the team to be at their best, then the team is going to create results much greater, broader, uh, more innovative than any one of us, including you know, me or any other leader um, could do individually. And I think that's a really important for less, lesson for leaders especially those who have been successful in getting stuff done to recognize that leading at scale is really about helping others to be at their best and work together for solutions that may not have been evident to any single individual. Yeah. And so you took over right before the pandemic. I mean, what's it like you worked your whole life to earn the top <laughs> spot and then it gets handed to you. It's like, okay, well, we're an insurance business now in the most serious global pandemic yeah. of maybe the last, you know, 50 to hundred years. Yeah. What was but that experience I, like for you in the company? I found out, you know, around the middle of December that this was going to happen on the 1st of February. So, you had a few weeks over the holidays to plan for, you know, what I thought would be my, my great, uh, you know, agenda now as the new CEO. And I think I got three or four weeks of grace before it became evident that this was going to happen. But I think what really happened for me, Jason, was a recognition that business is challenging. Um, I was going to be in a challenging time frame in USAA's history. So I kind of mentally prepared myself um, for the fact that there was going to be a lot of difficult decisions that were in front of us. I just didn't fully appreciate that they were going to be the crisis of the pandemic. But I had kind of got my mindset, you know, into that approach. Um, and I, you know, I sail a lot. Um, and I guess I have this view of you know, having a steady hand on the tiller, um, especially when the seas are rough or the wind is not, you know, blowing the way that you expect. And that's what I steeled myself for as we, you know, started dealing with this was, all right, don't sweat the small stuff, like deal with the challenges as they come. We're moving into a huge period of uncertainty. And if I can draw upon experiences from the past, you know, and apply them, you know, into the current environment, and not overreact to any bad news on any single day, you know, we'll find our way through this. Um, and I was able to draw upon some of the lessons from maybe the great financial crisis that came before, but also some lessons from, you know, one of you know, my great mentors that I worked for previously as well. And it starts first with, you know, understanding the mission and what's important. Um, and we were really clear um, in the beginning of the pandemic that the most important thing was taking care of our, um, our members. Um, and then you know, really recognizing that in order to do that well, you got to take care of your team and your employees. Um, and what we learned a lot in the great financial crisis uh, is you can never have enough liquidity you know, or financial strength. Yes. So we took on a pretty simple mantra there in March, which was, um, we're going to take great care of our employees, no matter what happens. And we told them that. And then we asked them um, to take great care of our uh, members during this period of time. And, and the Treasury team went about ensuring that 
you know, the financial strength was going to be there for whatever might happen in these, you know, very um, uncertain times. So that simple approach um, that we put in place kind of focused us on what mattered most. And we sent 30 something thousand employees home in nine days and got them set up at home to take care of our members. We probably had a couple of weeks of disruption and then we were back you know, serving our members really, really well from home. Um, and thankfully, you know, USA has been building financial strength for a long period of time. Um, and we were able to weather, you know, the storms from that standpoint um, as well. So those are some of the kind of immediate focus, the effort um, approaches that we took um, that I think were really, really effective for us. And then one of the things as I look back on this um, became really clear, like you have to make decisions even if you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And there was this sense of kind of urgency from survival mode that said, you have to make decisions today. So I've kind of talked about this in a humorous way, but I think it's very um, instructive. I call it Marine Corps math. Um, you know, if you got 70% right, um, let's make a decision and let's get going. Um, we can adjust and adapt tomorrow and we have to be willing to adjust and adapt tomorrow, but you can't wait and you can't sit back on your haunches um, when the world is moving, you know, at a really rapid pace. Yeah. How do you think about winning in this space of the insurance category? Because it's so different than a traditional business. It's not like you're building products and services and trying to give moments of delight, you know, in the best case scenario, your customers never have to <laughs> rely on you know, your abilities to help them. And so is it really just about the service to the members and the brand that you build? Like what builds a hundred year insurance company and, and how do you think about that next hundred years? Well, look, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, trust um, is how you win. Um, and you build that every single day as you engage, whether it's delighting them in terms of helping them get to the right coverage um, or whether it's like leaning in on those tough days when things don't go well and you got to help them put life back together again. Um, we build that trust one interaction at a time and we've done that consistently, you know, over a hundred years. But when I think about insurance, you know, many people might think about it in terms of, you know, boring or kind of confusing or complicated. For me, it's pretty simple. You know, having the right protection in place allows people to have peace of mind um, that when things do go bad, you know, there's a cushion there that is going to support and help them out. But it also is kind of the, um, the cushion that allows them to take prudent risk, um, whether that's risk in their personal lives um, or risk that companies might take as well. And recognizing the important role that insurance plays um, is how I think you can frame up um, for, uh, for winning. So if our members are feeling good you know, about their financial situation, and then the unfortunate days where they do have to use our services, we take great care of them. You know, I consider that, you know, a great way to think about winning. And then in really simple business terms, you know, we are a mission-based organization. You know, we care about serving military families and we care about serving them well. Um, and we care about the impact that has on them. So if we can serve more tomorrow than we did yesterday, and more of our members take full advantage of USAA's complete suite of products, um, then I think we're well on the way to that third piece of impact of making a difference in their lives. And I think that's the simple way that we think about winning today, that more and more military families see us as their provider of choice. And they do that because they've joined us and then they take more full advantage of everything USA has to offer. Yeah. All right, so here come the two time machine questions. Okay. If you could take a time machine back into your 20s, what professional advice would you give to that, Wayne, and why? <laughs> well, um, I would say to myself, one, um, absorb the bad news um, better than you did back then um, and project the positive news um, better than you did um, back then. Um, and I think as a kind of a young um, professional, um, you know, a young leader kind of coming up, someone with probably a level of intensity, you know, about their personality style, um, you know, what's happening today can, you know, have a really big impact. And I think, you know, what I've learned over the years is, um, especially in a leadership position, staying calm, um, absorbing the bad news, um, amplifying what's being done well, giving credit to the team beneath you, 
um, is one of the, I think, great hallmarks to deliver kind of, you know, consistency um, for your teammates. And the other I'll put into this um, place of not that you should be the same in how you act and react every day, but people can count on you to act a consistent way given the circumstances. Um, and I think what I um, have practiced over the years that I wish I was better at early on was, you know, the days that you know we're in brainstorming, we've got our brainstorming mindset in place. And the days that we have our um, test the team for their capabilities, I've got a little bit of my prosecutor um, you know, <laughs> mode on. And the days that we're approving things, you know, I've got kind of my more executive uh, you know, review um, in place. I think I'm a lot better at doing that today, or let's say intentional about doing that um, today. And maybe the last thing is, um, and I think about this um, in terms of uh, maybe a, a classic doctor's office, right? Where you're going from, you know, meeting to meeting or from patient to patient. Um, and you get a chance for a couple of minutes to get intentional um, about how you're going to act in that meeting um, or read that patient file before you walk into the room. And the ability to compartmentalize and be at your best, and be connected like they're the only ones that matter in that meeting. Um, and then put that aside um, and step into the next meeting um, and start all over again in an intentional way with that group, you know, is a level of maturity I wish I probably did better earlier in my career. What you said definitely strikes a chord. Yeah, I, I was a CEO of a venture back company. I started before this in my mid 20s, coming right out of law school. Yeah. And uh, I, remember, I remember feeling like it's my job to keep these really high standards for the company. Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to really focus the team on winning. And I do not think I did a good job of projecting the positive things. I, I remember feeling like, well, if I, if I amplify celebrating this achievement that I think is okay, but not great, it's going to lower the standards for everybody of what they think is all right to do. And I feel like in hindsight, I had that equation so wrong. You know, it wasn't, or it was, and it's like, okay, let's celebrate what we got done here. And there's an even higher bar that we can go to next time around. Um, and so I wish that you had given me that advice in my twenties also. Well, you know, getting that relationship, right. You know, I, I think a lot of folks talk about kind of three to one, the positive to the critical is the right balance. I don't know exactly what is the right balance. Um, what I do know is that, you know, um, wins um, build confidence and confidence builds momentum and momentum builds more wins. And if we can frame, you know, what we learn every day as a learning opportunity, as opposed to like we failed or we didn't get it right, then there's much more of a kind of growth mindset about the journey. Um, and it isn't a pass fail as much as it is, okay, how do we get, you know, even more effective uh, tomorrow? Um, and I, I wish I did that better earlier in my career. And there's probably, you know, four adult children today, you know, who wish dad was a little bit better about that early in their lives um, as well, because I probably learned on both dimensions uh, over time. Yeah, well, we'll get to the, hopefully the, that side, that to raise four kids while you're, you know, growing in the company like you did, I'm sure was a unique challenge. So maybe we'll address that too. All right, second time machine question. Now you take the time machine into your 30s and you can give yourself any professional or personal piece of advice. What's, what's that advice from Wayne to Wayne? Well, I'm going to say um, in my 30s, I would, um, I would probably have done one thing differently than I did. I probably would have gone to graduate school um, as opposed to getting my graduate degree from the School of Hard Knocks um, mm -hmm. over time. Um, but I would also say that um, being really intentional about my dominant strategy uh, and um, maybe being even more purposeful um, than I was. I think I was blessed in my career um, that I work at a company like USAA that recognizes talent. And I was blessed in my career from mentors um, who looked out for me, really sponsors who looked out for me. Um, but I think I probably could have been more you know, intentional um, and it really didn't manifest itself into the 40s. Um, but I think back in a really critical, you know, decision point where had I been more intentional, um, you know, the path might have looked, you know, slightly different um, than it uh, than it did. It eventually worked out just fine. Yeah. Uh, right. But it took a while to get there. 
And so when you talk about intentional about your dominant strategy, can you expand on that? Um, yes. Um, clear about purpose, um, knowing how you want to manifest your purpose and what you need to do in terms of gaining experience or taking risk um, in order to make that happen. And so I think about that as a primary path or the dominant strategy that I've laid out um, for my life. And it isn't just about you know, career, it's really about your life, right? Like what kind of dad do I wanna be? What type of parent or mom? What type of partner do I want to be? Um, what excites me? What am I passionate about? You know, what impact do I want to have, including, you know, my impact um, at, uh, at my career? Yeah. All right. So it feels like the rules of work are being rewritten in real time. <laughs> you took over the company and, and now all of us are living through both the great yeah. resignation and reshuffle where it's never been so hard to hire talent. But simultaneously, we're also seeing some large tech companies, right, as they're under pressure from the markets and, you know, to get more profitable, pull back on hiring a little bit. So what are you seeing in your business and space and how are you thinking about hiring and building teams and cultures here over the next couple of years? Well, I want to talk maybe about this in a more transcendent way and then in a tactical way. <clears throat> uh, this idea of knowing that what you do, <clears throat> excuse me, matters a lot or what we talk about as purpose um, is vitally important and being clear at a company level about what you stand for, who you are, why you exist um, really kind of sets the stage um, for talent, <clears throat> excuse me, talent attraction and development um, over time. And for us, that purpose has been pure and consistent for, you know, a hundred years. So I think that part is vitally important. Creating an environment where people can be at their best today, first, because they truly believe and feel like they belong as part of this team, that we've created a psychologically safe environment for people to kind of bring their humanity to work every day and then contribute in a way that is extremely valuable. Um, and then creating a system um, so that folks can um, truly see that they have an opportunity to reach and play to their potential um, are really the things we're working on today. But I'd argue we've been working on you know, consistently over a period of time. And if you can do that well, so that as a brand new college recruit or someone right out of high school who's coming here and sees that their work matters and that they are respected for who they are and there's a pathway for them to build skills um, and continue to have greater and greater impact over time um, is uh, you know, I think vitally important and, and just as important today as it has been um, in the past. Now, where are we today? We're facing the same challenges that you know, all companies are in that there is uh, more opportunity um, than there is qualified labor. And so convincing folks, inspiring them um, that this is a place where you can come and have a career, where you can come and have impact is something we have to work even harder on. Um, and there are times, maybe the last 12 to 18 months, where the allure um, you know, of the great opportunity to go for work for a great tech company is strong. Um, we don't see the same kind of market, you know, volatility that they would. Um, and our purpose that was just as exciting last year will be there tomorrow. Um, and our focus on serving military families will be, you know, consistent. So I think in periods like the last few years, you know, there may be a, an allure out there um, in periods where we may be headed to, although, you know, it's early, I think folks come back to, well, being with a company that cares about me a company that's going to be consistent and a company that's creating great opportunity and allowing me to do important work um, is a really cool place to be. Um, and then I do think, Jason, we have more work to do to convince people to show them that the work of insurance is actually an exciting um, field. Because yeah. uh, when you think about the ability to bring together user-centered design on one hand um, and analytics um, on the other hand, the ability to use the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain um, to make a beautiful experience, but also to manage a complex business um, at scale um, is a pretty exciting place to be. Yeah. We talked briefly before the interview started about, you know, a company that we were mutually involved in that I was on the board of and that USA had invested in. Is there any natural tension in the insurance space between being an insurance company and innovation? You know, you're in the business of managing risk. You have to manage your financials. So, mindfully, 
I, I, I've seen, I felt like I've seen from the outside over the last decade, insurance companies really try to become meaningfully more innovative, but it feels like there is some natural tension in how to figure out that right balance. <laughs> well, think about it. You have a large institution that is very dependent and focused on its analytics that as a business is primarily looking backwards at the past um, to project the forward, the, the future, um, there's a natural kind of stasis or a bias um, towards um, status quo. Um, I would also argue that maybe there isn't always enough competition that you know inspires you know big companies like that to step up and innovate. I think what's been really awesome over the last you know 10 or 15 years um, is the emergence of technology capabilities. And now the emergence of startup firms, you can call them fintechs or insure techs, um, that are recognizing the gaps in the member experience of larger and older companies and inventing a new mousetrap um, that is inspiring you know, to consumers, um, that is a wake-up call for um, larger companies. And I, I think that innovation actually is very complementary to what we are trying to accomplish. And maybe we all have a little more incentive today um, yeah. you know, to make that happen. I also think in terms of what you and I were talking about earlier, you, know, you might argue that you know, the more exposure there is, um, you know, the more premium that insurance companies will create at the end of the day. But from a consumer standpoint or an insurance perspective, the more that we can help to prevent um, losses, actually the lower the premium can be. And that's how we think about this is, you know, at the goal at the end of the day is to create peace of mind and protection. If we can eliminate risk and charge less, um, we would love to do that, you know, every single day. And that's one of the exciting things that's happening in the automobile insurance um, space today, where instead of, you know, me looking at who you are and your background and where you live, and what kind of car you drive and telling you how much your you know, insurance rate is, um, we now have an opportunity to see how you drive, where you drive, how much you drive, and the ability to lower your premium based on you presenting a lower risk um, to the association. And that's a great example of how we're bringing innovation into the space today with our safe pilot programs and now with our you know, uh, user-based insurance with our Nobler acquisition to better match the risk of the member um, with the rate that we are charging them. Um, that's very much in the center of the innovation space. So as you think out 10 or 20 years, what do you feel like are going to be the biggest innovations and differences and evolutions in the insurance space overall? Well, I'm going to speak from a personal lines perspective and say, look, there is a lot of innovation going on to keep cars from crashing um, and eventually to maybe eliminate the need for cars to have a driver. And there's more and more a view of, you know, can I rent something or use it on demand um, as opposed to owning it at the end of the day? And I think the combination of those factors, you know, are eventually going to have an impact on cars that are owned by individuals um, and the exposure associated with them, and therefore the size of kind of the underwriting exposure for auto insurance. And we're going to see some kind of shift from personal lines um, over to more commercial lines or product liability. So that is, you know, in flight today. You know, the beauty of our industry is, you know, that future is pretty exciting. It's just a question of when it is going to get there. But that will be a very significant shift. And we're addressing some of that already, you know, with structuring policies around how the car is used as opposed to just fixed term and fixed coverage. You know, I think on the homeowners um, side of things, obviously the number one issue is the weather um, and the severity of the weather and its impact. Um, and there, I think you know, we're going to really be challenged to figure out how do we build more resilient homes? Um, how do we um, look at where we build homes? Um, and how do we build more resiliency into communities as well? Um, and I think we're going to see and are already seeing you know, a lot of focus on um, building more kind of weatherproof homes in better places um, and, and kind of restructuring, you know, homeowners insurance um, around that. I think in the short run, you know, we're going to see uh, higher and higher costs um, because in the short run, we're not going to accomplish those three objectives. Um, but over the longer term, 
you know, I have hope for the industry that we'll figure out, you know, how to lower that risk. And then inside of the home, um, I think one of the most exciting developments that's more near field are all of the sensors and devices that tell you how your home is operating that help in terms of managing kind of everyday risk, but expensive risk like pipes breaking um, or security risks. And if we as an industry can figure out how to take that data, um, collect it and connect it in a way that's meaningful um, and show a customer, a member, an insured, how they can reduce their exposure at home and how we're willing to reduce the premium associated with their policies. I think there's a real win-win between consumers um, and insurance companies. Are there categories of insurance that aren't really mainstream today that should be like, for example, I've often thought, you know, shouldn't there be something that supplements traditional, you know, unemployment insurance from the government Hmm. where higher earners can have the opportunity. And and I know they're niche products, but doesn't feel like it's massively popular. Like, is there a category of insurance that you think should be more widely available and and utilized by folks? Well, I think that um, as you, assess kind of the idea of insurance where, you know, pooling resources um, so that any individual doesn't, you know, feel the full brunt, you know, has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, are there opportunities where, you know, a group can better insure or be able to support others? You know, potentially, yes. And I think you see some of that in the context of USAA today, right, where you've got, you know, 13 million members and military members you know, who take care of each other. And then I will tell you what we have done, you know, outside of the boundaries of insurance, but maybe in the spirit of what you are talking about today, um, where we have put capital in, you know, to some of these veterans organizations um, that allow them to give grants or low interest loans, you know, to members who may be living, you know, close to the edge um, and can't, you know, balance or square um, their budget you know, on an ongoing basis. So there may be more of those types of opportunities. And certainly I think the private sector will continue to look, you know, for opportunities where it can lean in um, around where government has historically played. Yeah. You know, we started comparably all these years ago to really help improve company cultures to make workplaces meaningfully more transparent. As you now think about what you want to keep doing to build an amazing company culture, like how do you do that? How do you do it with so many employees? And, you know, it's got to be extra hard because people are going through their most difficult moments in life, you know, with you and, you know, they're, they're not going to be happy. (laughs) You know, it's going to be, it's like, even if you do a perfect job, they're still going through one of the hardest moments in their life. Yes, everyone's going to be on edge. Yeah, well, look, I I think we do a couple things like that really well that I would say counterintuitively are where we have some of the best engagement amongst our employees because they know they're leaning into a difficult space um, and they've got to be at their best um, every single day. And they also know um, that there's a huge kind of reward on the emotional side with our members if they get it right, right? Our catastrophe teams would be one example, Um, but I would also say the folks that work in our survivor relations team are another really good example. They come back to work every day and they deal with, you know, grieving members who have lost a loved one, a parent, a mom, a dad, a child, and help them kind of put the pieces back together, you know, following, you know, that really traumatic um, event. And those folks see that what we do um, is kind of the Lord's work, if you will, right? I mean, the mechanics of what we do are vitally important, but being that comforting kind of arm um, put around members at a really important time gives these folks like tremendous satisfaction. But I think back to your broader question for us, um, you know, I'll put it in really simple terms, you know, bring the the mission to life every day. Um, for our employees. So it isn't something we're just talking about or it's, some, it's something they can experience um, is a way of inspiring this culture of being committed to something larger than yourself. And in our case, being committed to taking care of military families. And we do that through storytelling of telling the story about how one of our great teammates or employees served one of our you know, great members, either with an opportunity or a time of great need. 
um, and syndicating that back out, you know, in living color, you know, to the rest of the team. Um, and I think that's a valuable way that storytelling about how we serve members really well today is inspiring and it draws others um, to want to do the work similarly. And then we've got a great program today in this idea of syndicating where individual employees talk about their story of why they came to work at USAA, what impacted them earlier in life, um, whether they served or the spouse of someone served or they were touched in some way um, by military families that has inspired them in the same way I described my experience to wanna be here on this team um, doing exciting and important work, um, doing it with great teammates, but knowing at the end of the day that it matters a lot who you did it um, for. And that missing ingredient you know, is really powerful and it can only be done through storytelling and kind of bringing it to life you know, in real form. And then just about every day or every week, our employees somewhere are out in a military environment connecting with our members face-to-face getting a real sense of what the military life is about um, and what a soldier, sailor, airman's life, especially our enlisted troops are about today to understand that that sacrifice is great. Um, they don't make a whole lot of money um, and we can get inspired you know, by taking um, great care of them. So those are kind of some of the kind of systematic ways that we bring the mission to life every day. And then this idea that we win as a team, um, that we take care of each other, just like we take care of our members, and that collaborating together to be able to create a better solution um, and innovating for the benefit of our members are the kind of other elements that sit on this foundation of honesty and integrity and loyalty and service, which are kind of the bedrock core values um, of USAA. Yeah. I feel like y'all communicate that really well. Like your, your brand advertising to me is really different. Like if you look at what's happening and like what happens in the insurance space, like you've got Geico that tries to be really memorable in their commercials, progressives all about cost savings. USA really leans in around values and, and all your advertising. Like it, from a consumer standpoint, like you feel it in the ads, it makes an impression and certainly, you know, who you are and what, what you represent with military families is so different, but is that a really conscious decision on the part of how you go about doing your brand advertising and building your brand? Um, it's extremely purposeful. In nine, for the first time, we started advertising on a national basis. So it was our time to decide, okay, how are we going to enter this market? And this idea of authenticity and really bringing the great work of our employees to life um, is a philosophical commitment we made back then. And one that's, you know, we've kept consistent over, you know, the last, you know, 12 or 13 years as we've continued to advertise, you know, our campaigns have shifted and morphed a bit, but that underlying sense of like really showcasing the fact that we care um, and that, and how we care um, has, has been the hallmark of, you know, all of our campaigns. So when you think about the future of USAA and what you're most excited for, you know, what's the top two or three things on that list? Well, look, number one for me is being number one um, in our members' eyes as a place that they trust um, for their financial advice um, and their solution. So, you know, we are today the number one choice for military families, and we look forward in the second century. It's my expectation that that continues to be the case. But I think we have to seek um, relevance for this shifting consumer base. Um, we have to, you know, continue to build resiliency in um, our model, um, our ability to adapt, you know, at speed and pace. Um, and then we have to do things um, in what I would call a responsible fashion, um, responsible to our members, to our employees, um, to the environment. And so those concepts um, about being relevant, resilient, um, and responsible will be the hallmark of how we reinvent um, USAA. But here's how I think about it quite simply. Um, what military members are gonna need 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now is going to change. Um, what isn't going to change is who they trust um, in order to deliver that. So I see us you know, as their trusted advisor and we are building you know, a platform to be their trusted advisor and help give them the right advice and then the right solutions, whether we manufacture those 
um, as part of USA's core operations, or whether we bring an ecosystem of partners to bear um, to be able to serve them with solutions that we don't manufacture, but we endorse um, that are going to continue to help them uh, build out their financial security. And obviously more and more in the future is going to be digital. Um, and whether you know today's smartphone, smartphone is the form factor or whether down the road it's the metaverse, um, the platform will still be based on this idea that they can trust us, that we have their back, that we're connected together, like we and they are one as part of this mutual association. And they know that we've got their best interests at heart and we're gonna to continue to give them great solutions to help them build financial security. Yeah. And how would you say that your leadership has most evolved over the last 10 years? Like, what have you continued to improve and get better at? Or what are things that you can even point to in more recent years? Like, you know what? I'm glad I'm not doing it that way anymore. <laughs> well, um, I, I would say that, um, you know, being a student of the game um, has been something that we talked about earlier that is um, probably a hallmark that people would say of, you know, I am constantly learning and challenging you know, to, uh, to, to be someone who understands. Um, I think recognizing um, and keeping in perspective the intensity of the game um, is something that, you know, I want to continue to be better at. I would say I'm better at um, today. Um, and then I would tell you that, uh, you know, when I um, got a chance to coach um, kids soccer, uh, one of the things that um, I added to the list was be nice. Um, <laughs> and I think it's, um, you know, this, um, you know, doing things well, but doing them with dignity and grace is vitally important. And there's probably no more important time in our history to do it now with the civil discourse as angry as it is with our country as polarized as it is. You know, I want to be that, you know, voice of getting it right. Um, but I want to be that voice, you know, of treating people with respect um, and creating, you know, a forum where people are willing to disagree with each other, but do it in a respectful way, which I'll come back and put it in the be nice category. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we end on this topic? Because we brought it up earlier and it ties in, I think, really meaningfully with what you were just talking about and the family focus on USAA. You talked about, you know, having these four kids, we've got little kids. For someone that's really ambitious and motivated and driven in their career, you know, over the past, you know, 20 plus years, what have you learned about striking that right balance between family and work and how do you navigate you know wanting to give all the time that you want to to your family with the demands of tens of thousands of people who look to you and rely on you every single day all right well this is an area that i won't tell you that i'm as um balanced as i aspire um to be what i'm really clear about is i'm making a difference at usaa today and what i'm really really clear about is the day i walk off the field um, someone else will step in my shoes and take up the baton um, or the guide on in military terms and lead USAA forward. And in not too short order after that, they will forget that I was ever here, right? And I make that point um, maybe embellished a bit to say at the end of the day, like family is what matters. Um, your friends are what matter. Um, and you know, ensuring that whatever role you play in life as a father, as a mother, as a parent, um, as a role model, um, that you do that well, because um, that's what really, really matters. Um, and I will tell you that um, I work on that, you know, every single day because I am inspired and challenged um, about making USA better tomorrow than it was um, yesterday. Um, and it's pretty easy to let that run 24 by 7, um, as opposed to turning it off appropriately um, and, you know, taking care of things on the home front. All right. So most selfish question I can ask, I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old boy at home. Any advice for how to handle little rascals like that that you learned <laughs> over your tenure? Well, here's what I would tell you. We went from two to four because we had twins um, and we figured out how to play zone defense. Um, and once we figured out how to play zone defense, you know, life got a whole lot easier. And I guess what I would tell you is what I think about in business today is don't sweat the small stuff um, because, you know, as new parents, you can get, um, you know, I think, pretty intense about things being exactly um, as they need to be. And, you know, after you get four, you kind of realize they're pretty durable and, you know, things are not as bad as they might, you know, seem, um, you know, every single day. Um, so that's a bit about, you know, what I, what I would share on that front. 
Well, Wayne, we sure appreciate your time today. It, it's amazing to see the 100-year tenure of USAA. It's incredible to see your 30-year tenure there and you know what you've achieved and where you're going to be taking this incredible organization. Thank you for all you do to support so many you know, millions of folks and military families and all the members that you have and all of your employees. Um, it was a real honor to get to spend some time with you here today. You and I are supposed to be mortal enemies because we're in Los Angeles, but both of us are out of the playoffs this year. So no <laughs> Spurs and no Lakers. So now we get to be the best of friends. Well, um, you know, it's a tough, tough period the Spurs are going through and um, uh, unfortunate about the Lakers uh, as well. So maybe next year, right? We can always uh, we can always aspire as we get into next season that uh, it will be a better outcome. Look, here, here's what I would say. One, thanks for the time today. You know, we are so focused at USA of taking care of military families. I think one of the maybe important points I'd want to talk to your audience about as well is the importance really of taking care of our veterans. As we look at the skills that are built in the military, um, you know, what is forged in some really tough situations, the leadership that folks come out with, the determination, the willingness to be part of a team, um, to be able to deliver great results for something that is bigger than themselves, you know, is a huge, huge benefit to any organization. And if you don't have a plan yet, um, or you want to embellish your plan, you know, to hire veterans, you know, it's vitally important. And we're always, you know, willing and able to share our practices as well. But, you know, get a chance not just to thank a vet, but hire a vet um, and make them a big part of your company. So thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Of course. And thank you to everyone out there, especially to reiterate Wayne's point. Thank you to all our veterans and everything you do, especially with everything going on in the world right now. And uh, stay safe, stay sane out there, everyone. And we're looking forward to having you for uh, many more of our CEO interviews here with incredible guests like Wayne. Thank you so much for your time again here today. Thanks, Jason.